Hello everyone. In this lecture, I will cover Chapter 10, Project Procurement Management. Procurement is essentially acquiring the resources that you require for the project. In this lecture, I will also cover the addenda on Agile Project Management and will contrast that against the traditional project management. Our learning objectives uh, for this uh, chapter is to describe various sources for required software, hardware, or staffing, and discuss how we plan to acquire uh, those resources. The case study that is included in the textbook for this chapter is an interesting case of Diago uh, company that provides uh, uh, or produces tequila in Mexico. The company was uh, a merger of two uh, previous uh, companies, but the uh, one of the key reasons for their success is the fact that they were able to effectively outsource uh, their infrastructure to IBM and then uh, later on to Tata uh, and be able to carry out many of their IT uh, missions uh, with that uh, effective contracting approach for the resources that they needed. So, why should we care about procurement management? First of all, for most projects, we don't have the resources required within our own organization. So, we need to acquire them from outside. Secondly, typically a, a significant cost is associated uh, with resources that are required for the project. Thirdly, the quality of resources we, we acquire will significantly impact the outcomes of our project. And lastly, management of procurement uh, and acquisition within the project and making sure that we have the proper resources uh, acquired at competitive price is a key responsibility of project managers. These days, it makes less and less sense for an organization to develop its own software when it can be acquired from outside. When you consider alternatives to in-house development, systems fall in one, one of these categories. They can be a, a package software uh, like Word, Microsoft Word or Microsoft PowerPoint that you can use for specific tasks and you don't ha uh, have access to their code, you cannot change uh, the program. Another uh, type is open source software. Uh, the uh, open source software, their code is available to the public, like Linux operating system or Firefox browser. Uh, generally, organizations buy the support for any open software that they use from a vendor. For example, organizations that use Linux operating system typically uh, acquire Red Hat as one of the vendors that supports Linux. Another form of software is software as a service, is when you use software essentially as a service on the cloud. Uh, for example, the Office 365 that is offered by GMU to students and, and staff is a form of um, uh, software as a service or class angle which is the feedback form 
uh, software that you use in the class. Another form is enterprise-wide solutions. Uh, these are uh, usually integrating many business processes uh, and business functions in an organization, like enterprise resource planning uh, tools such as SAP or, or Salesforce. IT service, uh, services firms so, such as CGI, Momentum, are typically used when a custom uh, application is needed by an organization and of course they don't have the resources within the organization to develop them. This uh, table uh, lists the, uh, the situations where the organization needs to consider a particular software source and the internal staffing required for that type of software. For example, if an organization is looking for word processing, which is a generic task in any organization, uh, we need the internal IT and user staff to define the requirements uh, for the organization if there are any particular requirements. For example, for many years at US courts, we used Word Perfect in, instead of Word because at the time Word Perfect had the features required for legal documents. That's why it was more attractive for US courts. As I mentioned earlier, enterprise resource planning systems, ERPs, integrate several business functions, such as HR or finance, into a series of modules that are integrated, and they all work off the same database. So for example, when you add an employee in the HR module, the same employee and, and that employee's information is avail available in the finance module. So this, uh, so implementing ERP system, it is very challenging uh, and because they are very complex. Uh, and the organization that implements an ERP to be successful, they need to adopt the business processes that are built into the, the ERP system. Uh, these systems, uh, however, uh, when implemented, provide a very flexible and efficient uh, processes in the organization, and they eliminate multiple data entries and data reconciliation among various uh, applications at the enterprise level. Sometimes organizations decide to implement the best of the breed instead of an ERP. In this approach, the organization may implement uh, the best HR system and the best finance system. But then they have, the organization has to make sure that these various applications communicate with one another so that, it, so that the organization can prevent multiple and duplicate data entries. We said one of this, the ways or alternatives to internal development is using an outside uh, software organization. Uh, well, there are, uh, this is a major business and there are major global software companies. And this is the list in 2017 in terms of the largest players in this space. And uh, uh, these, uh, organizations provide different expertise and uh, uh, from your perspective really any of these organizations or uh, potential employees uh, employers uh, for not only software developers 
but also for people who have project management expertise. In the last 20 years or so, offshoring has become more popular as countries like India offer development services at a lower cost. When you're choosing uh, these offshore, uh, offshoring services, the organization needs to have a very strong business team that can articulate and verify the business requirements. At the same time, some of the outsourcing companies may not have the program management expertise and general management expertise. In those cases, the organization that is using them must provide project oversight. Uh, another challenge to keep in mind when you're uh, offshoring is that uh, you are going to have the challenges of geographical separations, this time zone difference, and cultural differences. Procurement management processes, very similar to other project management processes, consist of planning, plan procurement management, execution, which is conducting procurements, and uh, controlling, controlling procurements. Again, this, this is very similar to other processes as we have studied in the past. In the planning stage, we use project documents such as resource requirements document that identify resources required for the project. We then determine whether it makes sense to make the resource or buy the resource. If we decide to buy it, then we need to research the marketplace and determine what sources are available for acquiring that resource. After we identify the resources we need to acquire, then we need to decide what, what is the appropriate type of contract for acquiring those resources. We can, uh, in some cases, when we have all the uh, requirements detailed out and spelled out, we can use fixed price contracts. As the label suggests, this is where the vendor provides a fixed price for delivering the services and, uh, and or products that we are requiring. Fixed fee contracts are those that are appropriate for when we want to fix the fee and overhead of a contractor and agree to reimburse the contractor's other costs. This uh, contracting approach is good <clears throat> when the requirements are not complete. I actually used this type of contract when I was managing a building project for Chevron. I brought on board a general contractor, a general construction contractor, uh, to work with us, to work with Chevron staff to finalize subcontracts as requirements are being finalized. Uh, you know, requirements for electrical, plumbing, and so forth. Cost reimbursement uh, contract is uh, where the contractor's costs are reimbursed in addition to predetermined percentage for, say, indirect costs or profits. Time and material contracts enable us to set a unit cost uh, for labor or material for a particular product or service and, and we can use as much of quantity of those products or services that we need to use for the project. <clears throat> Capped 
time and material is just a special form of, of time and material contracts where the total co contract amount cannot exceed a preset limit that we have negotiated. Incentive contracting is when we provide an incentive for contractor to achieve certain targets. For example, if the contractor completes the project by certain date, uh, we can provide an incentive for that. I actually have used this type of contracting for um, with safety and schedule incentives in the past, and they work very nicely. When we discuss contract costs, we have to keep in mind that majority of the cost is direct cost, such as the cost of labor or material. However, there is also an indirect cost associated, say, with management and support that is indirectly provided to the project. For example, the cost associated with payroll or office space costs associated with the contract at the contractor project team, that would be an example of an indirect cost. In order for us to effectively contract for services at competitive prices, we need to work with the contract staff in our organization to ensure that the uh, contracting documents are clear and they're complete. <clears throat> For example, it is critical that the, the statement of work, SOW, accurately lists everything that the contractor has to perform. We also need to make sure that we don't select contractors just based on the price of, uh, that they offer us, but rather look at their entire offering. Uh, and consider the quality of the contracting organization and their staff when we are evaluating uh, various contractors. Another uh, tip is to use incentive when it makes sense. For example, if an organization can save, say, $100,000 if a project finishes a month earlier, it would make sense to include say a $10,000 bonus to the contractor if the schedule is shortened by a month. So that's, uh, that's something to consider when those situations exist to provide incentive contracting or to use incentive contracting. As we just discussed, an accurate and a complete statement of work is critical for successful contracting. Uh, this slide shows a sample outline for SOW statement of work. Note that, for example, all deliverables by tasks need to be listed in the SOW to make sure that it's complete. It lists all the tasks. Otherwise, anything that is left out can be uh, disputed by the contractors that is not part of the contract, and rightfully so. When we identify a resource or a product we need, we would typically put a request for proposal or RFP together. <clears throat> this slide shows the list of activities for an RFP. And uh, one of the key activities that need to be included in an RFP is the evaluation criteria by which we will select the winning contractor. These criteria need to be part of the RFP and sent to the contractors so they can accordingly ensure that they satisfy those criteria. One of the reasons I selected this textbook, uh, textbook for the course is the fact that it covers agile project management, uh, which 
is getting more and more popular in many organizations. In this lecture, I will briefly cover agile addenda uh, that are included in the textbook. Agile project management is an iterative approach where we deliver parts of the system in each iteration, usually called sprint or scrum. In each iteration, we go through, analyze, design, build, test, and deploy phases. One of the key requirements in Agile is that there needs to be a product owner as part of the project team. The product owner is typically from the user organization or from the business organization. Also, the role of the project manager morphs into or turns into more of a facilitator in Agile uh, project management. The reason for that is that Agile uh, project team are empowered to resolve issues among themselves, typically through their daily stand-up meetings. In this table, you see the comparison of Agile versus waterfall or traditional uh, project management methodologies. As you can see, Agile focuses on each increment or iteration, while Waterfall focuses on the entire project. Here you see various activities in Agile. For example, in the planning stage, we need to define what is considered done in each iteration. Also, we need to have all the features that need to be developed on the backlog list, which of course that list gets updated and, and potentially reprioritized after each iteration. The daily stand-up meetings are the primary ways that the project team communicates uh, and shares the status with one another. It's important th that these meetings, however, are kept short and to the point. That's why they're, uh, uh, they're held when participants are literally standing. That's why they're called stand-up uh, meetings. Well, this concludes uh, my lecture on chapter 10, as well as the Agile Addenda. Thank you very much for your uh, attention, and we'll see you next time. Bye.